but only people who talk well unmuted will show up in the video. So if you don't want to be videoed, we are not videoing you. Um, later on when we get to the Q&A, you can always um, use the chat function if you have a question you'd like to ask and either Davith or I will be moderating those and asking questions. Yes. So um, don't worry if you don't want to ask a question face to face. Um, also, for those of you who haven't been using Zoom a whole lot, you may find that you have a better experience tonight if you put yourself, put things in speaker view um, so that you get um, our guest authors looking large when they are talking. Um, but that is your, whatever is comfortable in a happy setting for you is again, by us. Um, Sabbath, does that cover our sort of welcome logistics? Is there something I'm forgetting? I think that's everything we're recording, which is what we I, I keep forgetting to do, at least until a few minutes later. So we apologize about these upcoming YouTube videos that start five minutes late. Um, <laughs> I think that covers everything. Uh, oh, next week, we will um, be sending out a newsletter that has the password, the our, our monthly, I mean, not next week, on Friday, we have a monthly newsletter going out that has a new uh, button link. You can look for it where you can select to get the um, monthly, they'll get the weekly newsletters and have your passwords for um, every week's Northshire Live. Uh, and we are also experimenting next week with a new Zoom Northshire event where we're going to have a bookseller happy hour on Tuesday at five. Um, we've got a few booksellers um, lined up to join us and hang out and tell everyone about great books that they've been reading. So if you are looking for book recommendations from wonderful booksellers who read a ton, um, Tuesday at five is your chance for that. So that's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, so for those of you I don't know, I'm Rachel. I'm the event manager for North Star Bookstore in Saratoga Springs. And I am going to introduce our guest authors this evening. Um, Isabel Sterling has graciously agreed to be our interviewer tonight. She is the author of the young adult novel, These Witches Don't Burn. Um, and her second novel, This Coven Won't Break, will be released in May and can be pre-ordered now. And Davith is, I think, going to drop a pre-order link into the chat if anyone is interested in doing that. Um, and then Jennifer Dugan is our guest author this evening. I first met her last year um, as she was getting ready for the release of her debut novel, the absolutely wonderful book, Hot Dog Girl. <laughs> it was so much fun working with her to plan her launch event for that book and getting to know both her and her writing. She's got a gift for really capturing the inner lives of teens in her books, and we're very lucky to be able to have her here with us today to celebrate the release of her second novel, Verona Comics. So take it away, Isabel and Jen. Thank you. Right. Thanks for having us. All right, so first off, Jen, um, congrats on the release of your second novel. Thank so the you. first thing I want to know is how does it feel to be officially a multi-published author? Um, it definitely feels kind of surreal, uh, uh, definitely very exciting. It's a strange time to be putting out a book, for sure. Um, it's a little hard, like I wish I could go into stores and visit it the way that I could visit Hot Dog Girl. Yeah. Um, but it's pretty awesome, you know, and I'm starting to see, you know, the deliveries are all going out, so people are sending me a lot of pictures of them with my book, so it's, it's very cool a little different than expected, but it's very cool. Yeah, definitely understandable. So before we get to your new book, um, I first want to give a little shout out to Hot Dog Girl, because Hot Dog Girl does turn one years old today. Yes. So I would love to hear a little bit about sort of your first year as a published author, and first kind of what was your, and um, also this is December, who's just going to keep popping <laughs> in the chat. <laughs> Gonna be a nuisance. Um, but what was the biggest surprise about sort of life post publication? Um, it was definitely very surprising the amount of like voices that you get in your head after your book is out. Everybody has like an opinion and they really want to tell it to you. Um, whether they like super loved it or they took issue with something or whatever it is. So it, it was definitely surprising how I thought for sure like I could just handle that and like I'm like that's not going to get to me. I've heard other authors talk about it but it'll just roll off my back. But then I was like 
texting my therapist like, oh, somebody said something mean on the internet or somebody said <laughs> something really sweet on the internet. Um, so it was surprising how much like how vulnerable you feel when you send it out. I wasn't, I thought I had like that distance, um, but you really don't, like you don't. It's like you're sending something so personal out into the world and there's just a level of vulnerability that you just have to like, you have to maintain it to create, but you also have to get a thick skin so that it doesn't, you know, finding that balance, it was really kind of a wild year for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think especially, you know, writing contemporary and very sort of like real kind of characters, you can probably feel even more vulnerable when people take issue with messy, the messiness that we might have had ourselves when we were teens. Mm -hmm. so. so what was your favorite hot dog girl related memory from the past year? Well, there's been so, like, there's been so much good stuff. Um, I got to travel a lot. I got to do a couple, like, very major festivals that I wasn't expecting, you know, anything like that to happen. Um, and so that allowed me to meet a lot of teens. I also, last summer, really focused on doing some teen-only events. And getting to meet the kids that I was writing for was definitely my favorite, um, whether I was seeing them in, in their schools or libraries. Um, it was just amazing because the kids were really, like, the teens are really connecting with it. And so to have a teen come up and say, you know, I really felt seen by this, it was just like, I was like over the moon. That's like a high you ride for like ever. <laughs> for sure. I also love the school visits. Teens are just the coolest, 100%. All right, so now we're going to transition to your new book, Verona Comics, yeah. which, as you know, I love this book so, 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 so much. Um, before we get into all the questions, and we're actually going to do a brief little reading, I would love if you could pitch the book for everybody so they know what it's about. So Verona Comics is, uh, it's a loose Romeo and Juliet retelling set in the comic industry. Uh, so it follows uh, two kids, Ridley and Jubilee. Uh, Ridley's family is kind of from this big corporate comic type of a thing. And uh, Jubilee comes from, uh, her stepmom's owns uh, a comic shop called Verona Comics that's very indie and really beloved. She's an artist and makes comics herself. Um, so the two families are kind of, at, they're kind of feuding, uh, and the kids meet one day at a Comic-Con prom when they're in cosplay, so they're completely in costume, they have no idea who each other is, and, uh, and then sparks kind of start to fly from there as they figure out, you know, not only who each other really is, which is kind of, an, it takes a little while for them to work all that out, um, but they start to rely on each other more and more. Um, there's some really great, uh, it, you know, there is like a very cute romance, but it also explores a lot of themes of like identity, especially various sexualities and, and the feeling of am I queer enough? Am I too much? Um, and also mental health things really does struggle with anxiety and depression. And we get to really see the impact that that has on a relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're definitely going to talk about all those things here in a bit. Um, so we are going to do a quick little reading um, for the folks watching. Do you want to um, sort of, since we are starting on chapter 17, do you want to yeah. give folks a little bit of background of where we are in the story? So some of the chapters are a little bit different, and they actually are done completely via text message. So we thought it would be fun to do, yes, chapter 17. So we thought it would be fun uh, to read one of the text message chapters. Um, and uh, we'll each take a role. So in this one, Jubilee uh, has, in the previous chapter, had a kind of intense conversation with her friend, uh, Shayla, and she's trying to kind of figure out because Jubilee identifies as queer, um, but now she has a crush on this boy, and uh, she's trying to really wrestle with how that all fits and, you know, does she count? even though her friends are very supportive of her, um, she still has just this internalized kind of confusion that she's working with. Um, so for this chapter, I am going to be Ridley, whose nickname is Bat. 
And Isabel is going to read Jubilee's sections, which are, um, she goes by Peak because when they first met, they were dressed as Batman and a Peacock. Hey, what are you up to? Laying on my bedroom floor, having an existential crisis. Um, I think that's my line. Is there some kind of existential crisis timeshare we were supposed to negotiate ahead of time? Yes. I'm listening. Wednesdays are reserved for my angst only, so... LOL. Oh good, you're laughing. Now I don't have to sue you for infringing on my official angst day. What days do I get? Uh, 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. on Sundays, 3.30 to 5 p.m. on Tuesdays, and Thursdays from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. Those are all times I'm sleeping, except for Tuesday, which is when I have a lesson. Yeah, that was my whole plan. Sleep through your suffering or channel it into music. Why don't you do that? Because I have no self-control and am needy as shit. And yet, for some reason, you like talking to me. Stop. You're not needy. Have you met me? Once for a second, but I was distracted. You were very cute and nervous, and I didn't hate that. I was trying for manly and strong, but... Have you met you? Once for a second, but I was very nervous. Crying laughing. Did you want to talk about it? Question mark? Whatever's got you lying on the floor creeping on my angst allotment. Yeah, but I don't think you would understand. I'll try not to take that personally, but I'm totally going to take it personally, so thanks. I'll be needing that angst allotment back to deal with it. It might even creep into your Sunday hours, to be honest, but you brought this on yourself. Ha, okay, fine. Do you ever feel like you're not enough of something or you're too much of something else? Every day. What do you do about it? Nothing healthy. Helpful. Frowny face. No, seriously, what do you do? Obsess over ways I could make myself more or less until I'm completely spun out and don't know which way is up. It is not a method I would recommend. Yeah, sound shitty. Astute observation. I wish you were here. Me too. I should probably get some sleep. It's late. Plus, I don't want to take up too much of your inks allotment. It sounds like you need it. I appreciate that, but peak? Yeah? Whatever it is, you're definitely enough. Like, exactly the right amount. I guarantee it. Smiley face. So, uh, as you can all probably see now, I there's lots of reasons to adore this book. It's super sweet. It's super funny. Um, it handles all of the mental health stuff really well. It also has a lot of exploration of queer identity. And it's just fantastic. It's so good. <laughs> Thank you. As Jen knows, I actually read it. I was at a conference and I was like stinkily reading it because I was like, oh, this is so good. I can't, I can't turn away. Um, all right. So one of the things that wasn't um, too heavy in this section, but this book deals a lot with the comics world. And it's mm -hmm. very clear that you like know your stuff when it comes to comics. So how did you first get involved with that whole scene? Um, I've been a huge fan of comics uh, for a long time. And I've also put out some comics on my own. Uh, so I spend a lot of time at Comic Cons in Artist Alley with my books and you know my friends, and so it's just a big it's a big part of my life. Um, so it seemed really natural um, that I would kind of incorporate it. And when I'm sitting in Artist Alley, you know, and there's a little bit of downtime, I always kind of like people watch and try to be like, oh, okay, like those people are like I make up little stories about all the people that I'm watching um so it just kind of grew from that where I was like hmm, this would probably be a really cool setting yeah so is that so my next question was kind of what made you want to set your story in that industry and it sounds like it was spending a lot of time kind of you know on the artist alley yeah it's such a like I said it's such a big part of my life that it just felt very natural to kind of explore that and explore that area of things. And um, plus it's just kind of a really fun setting. You know, in Hot Dog Girl, we were at, you know, like a rundown amusement park. And now, you know, we're in the indie comics world. 
so it just seems like a natural transition. Yeah, I love it. And what else I loved about it is, so I'm not really somebody who knows a lot about comics, but it was still, the book still felt very accessible to me. Mm -hmm. um, but I got the sense also that if you are somebody who really gets comics, like there's going to be all these extra things in there that like extra kind of depth to the story. So I was wondering if you had any favorite hidden references that you kind of snuck into the book. Yeah, well, early in the draft, I think um, earlier drafts maybe weren't so um, user friendly, um, but a really good litmus test was anytime my editor was like, what does this mean? I'm like, okay, I need to like revisit this and make it, um, you know, find another way to say it or, or give better context clues. So it was definitely like helpful to have someone outside of that world reading it. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a lot of little things like some of the books that I, some of the comics that I describe um, in the comic store are real comics that I love, or um, there's an argument that takes place about who is the best Robin, because um, Batman has had a series of Robins, and um, that is like kind of uh, to my best friend who like hardcore has um, her favorite Robin. So when we were editing, I was like, this scene must stay, like <laughs> while they're having the great Robin debate. So Anybody who reads comic, who really reads comics is going to get to that scene and be like, oh, like they're going to have feelings about that. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have a favorite Robin or do you leave that to your friend to, to fight that out for you? No, well, she is very DC and I am very Marvel. Mm, um, okay. So her favorite Robin would correspond in the Marvel universe as my favorite character, funny enough, which is the Winter Soldier. Oh, okay. they're pretty much the same character. <laughs> so, yeah, I love so I would side with her, I guess. I think it's, and keep some harmony in the friendship. I think those are all important things. Yeah, that's important. All right. So um, part of what I love about this book is both Ridley and Jubilee are bisexual, and they're both kind of wrestling with that identity in really common but sort of opposite ways um, throughout points of the book. Ridley worries that his bisexuality makes him too much for people, whereas Jubilee kind of conversely worries that because she's currently attracted to Ridley, who is a boy, she's not enough um, and she's not queer enough. So I would love um, just to hear a little bit about kind of why you wanted to explore bisexuality kind of from two different points of view like this. Yeah, I think um, we don't have a lot of like currently, I don't think we're seeing a lot of male, female, uh, queer pairings. And in the real world, when you have that, um, it can be a really hard place to be um, because it, it can be really hard to kind of find that sense of community. Um, so that was something I really wanted to explore in this book. And I really wanted to show what um, being in a different gendered queer relationship could feel like to the people in it. Um, where Ridley, he very, uh, he's very accepting of who he is, um, but he also, you know, has in the past had uh, people maybe shy away from him because of that. Whereas Ridley, or Jubilee, I wanted to give her a really strong sense of, of a queer community. Um, and so she actually has kind of the opposite experience where um, you know, her best friend is a lesbian and she has two moms and everybody feels very accepting of who they are and like they know who they are. Um, so I thought it would be really fascinating to write a character who is still kind of, you know, figuring it out and figuring out the fact that your sexuality isn't tied to whatever gender person you're dating at that moment, um, which is something I think that gets forced on a lot of people in the bi community. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I think, one of the tricky parts with being bisexual is you sometimes get the, you know, negative messages from the straight community, but also sometimes, like, from within the kind of the queer community, too. There can be some gatekeeping there, which is not super fun. Yeah, I um, just really wanted to show, you know, uh, there's this stereotype that it's like a like a pit stop or like in, in between while you're figuring it out. So I really wanted to show two characters where that's 
not the case. Mm -hmm. Was there anything in particular you were hoping readers would take away from kind of reading a relationship like theirs? Yeah, I just wanted, you know, any teens that are, you know, maybe see themselves in that to really understand that it's okay to, um, you know, love who you love and accept who you are and, and um, kind of unwind those feelings and work through them. And I really wanted to show that in kind of a, you know, a positive way. It was really important to me that um, while Jubilee had those feelings, she wasn't getting any kind of negative feedback. She has a very supportive community around her um, because I wanted kids uh, or teens, anybody that's kind of wrestling with that to know, you know, that that's possible, that, you know, it can be this great fulfilling supportive thing. It doesn't have to be something that you're, you know, ashamed of or, or scared about. I love that. I'm going to show the covers again because you have beautiful cover art. So <laughs> in Hot Dog Girl, I just, I love these covers so much. I need all the love. Um, so this was kind of your, you know, it's a fun, quirky, romantic comedy. Um, Verona the comics, on the other hand, and I'm going to, again, just beautiful, absolutely gorgeous <laughs> art. So what? Jeff Osberg did both of those. And um, he is uh, an illustrator in Sweden and he is amazing. So, so good. Um, so in Verona Comics also has this, you know, really lovely romance with Ridley and Jubilee. There's, you know, as we saw in the text exchange that we read, there's some really great moments of humor in here, but it also deals with, um, you know, some potentially toxic people pleasing um, tendencies on Jubilee's part and really does live with intense anxiety and he's got, you know, a father that's a bit emotionally abusive and I thought, that, you know, these parts of the novel felt, you know, so real and were handled with such care and empathy and were part of what had me sort of like tearing through the book so fast because I just needed to know what was going to happen to these, you know, characters who just felt so real. Um, so one of the things that I really especially loved was how you treated and kind of handled uh, mental health while you were going through the book and especially love that we never fall into the sort of love cures everything trope that can be common, especially I think sometimes in YA. Um, so I would love if you could talk a little bit about how you approach the mental health discussions in the book. Yeah, it was um, like, like you said, it, it was super important to me that it wasn't a love cures all situation because that's not the reality. Um, a lot of people who are living with mental illness um, you know, they need to, you know, it really can impact a relationship. And that's what I really wanted to show was the impact that things like anxiety and depression um, and some codependency and, and the toll that that can take on a relationship. Um, but also it was very important to me that um, we had a positive view of, you know, mental health services, um, and things like that in the book. So for me, I really wanted to show an honest take because while I think there's definitely a place for, you know, the, the struggling person meets like a manic pixie dream girl and lives happily ever after, um, I think those books are a lot of fun and there's definitely a place for them. Um, but what I wanted to add to the conversation was that it's not always, someone else can't always save you. Um, and it's not always fair to ask that of them either. Um, and that can have a toll on the person, you know, that impacts both people's lives in the relationship. Um, so I tried to show that very sensitively, um, but also very realistically. Mm -hmm. And I think that definitely, at least for me as a reader, that came through very strongly. Um, that, you know, something that you care deeply about and it did feel very real, but also, um, Oh, it was handled with care, I think was just kind of the best way to say it. Um, yeah. but what was the, sorry, go ahead. No, I just wanted to say that I, I also wanted to um, kind of instill this sense of like hope also. Mm -hmm. So like um, even when you're going through it, like there's still a lot of really beautiful moments and a lot of fun and laughter and, and all of that stuff, um, even in, you know, some of the darkest Times that they're going through, which I think was also really important to, to show that it's kind of, you know, there's ups and downs and it's not, you know, snap your fingers and you're all better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do love, um, and I will not give any spoilers, 
But I do love that, you know, at some point, like, you know, this does have a really significant impact on both of them. And things do get, you know, pretty intense. And I think it um, just kind of shows kind of the importance of making sure you're reaching out to people and getting the support that you need. Um, Because things can can go poorly um, pretty quickly. Um, But on a slightly more fun note, um, so when, (laughs) when Ridley does start sometimes, he'll kind of like spiral with anxiety. Sometimes Jubilee will kind of supply him with like random like little like tidbits of information. Um, and I wondered kind of where did you find all these weird random facts and if you had any favorites that you had to cut when you were editing? I actually got to keep, I think, all of my facts. I, I think they all made the cut as far as I can remember. Um, and some of them I knew just because I am like this weird like, I like to know everything about anything that interests me. So if I'm like, oh, I like this animal, then I'm going to read everything about, you know, peacocks or whatever and be like, oh. Um, But I definitely spent a long time Googling, like, weird facts and, like, (laughs) my my search history was very strange for a very long time. you know, because I'd be like, what are weird facts about bats? What are weird facts about peacocks? And um, <laughs> there was the one about blowing bubbles at sharks. And, and so um, I just thought that would be a really fun way to interject some like levity into some of the like heavier moments. Um, it felt like it would be like just ridiculous enough um, that it would, you know, just like a little shot of sunshine. Yeah, I thought they were so fun. And if I remember correctly, was it something that Jubilee's mom kind of did for her before, initially, right? And then she kind of passed it on to, to Ridley? Yeah, so Jubilee is actually like a, um, a cellist at, at a very high level. So she's always doing these performances. And when she was little, um, her mom used to carry around like the, like the Guinness Book of Records and Books of Weird Facts. And when she would get nervous before performances, they would, um, her mom would read them to her. Yeah, I love I love that little tidbit, and I love kind of how Jubilee then sort of like pays it forward, which mm-hmm. I thought was really sweet. Um, so also in the book, as we did with our with our reading, there is some chapters that are strictly just this back and forth texting between Ridley and Jubilee as their alter egos of Bats and Peak, which you'd explained earlier was kind of their nickname was from their costumes when they met at Comic Con, um, which is such a cute, um, neat, cute scene in the beginning there. Um, but you do such a good job of making, you know, the text messages feel like really fun, relatable, and just very, very teen. And I wondered if you had any insight into like, how do you kind of write good text messages in like book form? <laughs> um, I just, uh, well, in the early drafts, that it would literally be like, insert something witty. <laughs> and then I would just move on. Um, so I really like left a lot for future me that when I went back to revisions, I'd be like, oh, I'm like cruising through this. And then I'd get to a chapter that was like two lines and then just like funny exchange, it would say. And I would have to <laughs> go through and figure it out. Um, I just tried, I just really tried to get in their heads and really. Um, like listen to their uh, like music is such a big part so I would always listen to their playlist before I had to write them um, because it's hard to write uh, text chapters because you have no dialogue tags you have no verbal cues so you have to get the um, you have to get all the emotions across just in words and as we know from our own text exchanges that's really um, there's a lot of room for miscommunication when you can't mm-hmm. hear tone. Um, so yeah, it was it was definitely a challenge, but um, also those were some of, are some of my favorite chapters in the end. There's some like, very cute moments in them. Yeah, I, I definitely loved the um, the text chapters, and I know kind of later on we also get to see some texting between Ridley and his older sister, which was also really nice. Um, so overall, I mean, I can't say enough good things about this book. I loved it so much. <laughs> Um, Do you have any final thoughts on Verona Comics? I have one other question for you, but I want to make sure I covered everything you wanted to talk about with Verona. Yeah, no, I think, um, I I think we covered a lot of things. 
Cool. <laughs> I wanted to give you your last chance. Okay, so before we open it up, I think we are going to have the availability for some audience questions if folks are around and want to ask questions. But I was hoping that you might be able to give us a hint of what you might be working on or what the future might have in store. Yeah, I have a lot of uh, balls in the air right now that aren't, um, you know, that you'll be hearing more about soon. Um, so I am working on another, uh, like a queer romance about a track star and a beauty queen. Mm -hmm. um, very, very excited uh, to tell everybody more about that. And then on the comics front, I've been working on a graphic novel. And um, this one is a little bit different. Um, my comic work is a lot more of like fantasy, supernatural, things like that. Um, so that's really where I've kind of built my audience on that front. Um, which is obviously a departure from all of the, um, you know, when I'm working in YA novels, I'm usually sticking to contemporary. Um, so I will have some more information about my upcoming comic projects pretty soon, too. Um, but that's definitely going to have more of like a fantasy supernatural bent to it. Awesome. And for anybody who might be interested in the indie comics that you've done, is there a way for people to find that stuff? Yes. Um, today is actually the last day that I'm doing it, but I did do, um, I do have a pop-up shop right now for my comics. So you can go on my website, uh, which is jldugan.com and find out more about the comic side of things. Um, those are usually, usually I only sell those in person at Comic-Con. So um, I just, decided as an experiment to do a little pop-up shop online and, and and get it done there. Cool. Well, on a personal note, don't let me go to bed tonight until I've ordered those. <laughs> I keep forgetting to do that. <laughs> All right. I will text you after this and <laughs> thank you for your money. <laughs> So I do really want to read them. All right. Um, so that is all I have. So I don't know if we have any audience questions. We do have one in the chat. And just to reiterate for folks who tuned in late, we are recording this for subsequent broadcast on YouTube and on Northshire's Facebook pages. So if you don't want to appear on the video, as long as you stay muted, you will not. Um, if you unmute yourself and ask a question with your voice, which you may do, you would be in the video. So that's up to you. If you want to ask a question that way, you can just wave your hand and we'll see you and unmute you. Otherwise, you can put a question in the chat and Davith and I will be reading them out. Um, so that's that logistical note. And then the other logistical note is that Davith has put in the chat links to order Verona Comics from Northshire.com. Um, also to order Isabel's first book, um, These Witches Don't Burn, and to pre-order her second book and to order um, Hot Dog Girl, Jen's book, first book, which is newly out in paperback. So um, with those logistical notes um, from the chat, we had a question, um, which was, did you consider adding any comic panels to Veronica? Um, no, I didn't. Although I think it would be fun to do something along the comic lines with it. Um, I didn't, Verona Comics was definitely always a, um, meant to be a novel. Um, I think it, I think it would be fun to have some little designs and in the, on the insert co uh, cover, Jeff Osberg drew me a little, um, I don't know if you can see that, but some of the comic books that, um, Jubilee's stepmom writes. Um, so he's really good about putting in kind of like little details like that. Um, but in terms of actually putting panels throughout the book, that would have been a cool idea. But I did not, I did not do that. There's and then, um, so from Cassandra uh, for Isabel. I'll ask that real quick, then we'll get to you, Rachel. Um, when writing Witches and Coven, how did you balance the magical elements? also with the realism? Ooh, that's a cool question. Um, it was definitely took a number of revisions to get that balance. Um, actually, when I wrote the very first draft of These Witches Don't Burn, there was no magic. <laughs> and then um, basically every draft I did thereafter, I just added more and more magic until I got what I felt was like a really good balance. Um, but I really wanted to tell a story that felt like it was very much kind of our world with sort of 
in some ways, a lot of like real teen issues, like dealing with a breakup and having new crushes and stuff, but then just the magic just sort of like woven seamlessly with all of that. I can't believe there was no magic at one point. I like, having yeah, read so many drafts of this book, <laughs> it's, it's so wild. Yep. <laughs> so, Jen, I would love it, Jen, if you could talk a little bit about something that you mentioned to me back when we met last year, which is the fact that part of the inspiration for Verona Comics was Romeo and Juliet. Mm hmm. Yeah, um, which is just something I found very interesting for a contemporary young adult with very, very contemporary teens. Yeah, well, I think, you know, a lot of people talk about Romeo and Juliet like it's this like epic love story. Um, and then if you really step back out of it for a minute and take a look at it, you're like, what is happening? Um, this is This is a mess. Like this is you know, it's not an ideal love story. So I liked the idea of taking that setup, kind of the, um, the, you know, the dueling families and not knowing who you are when you first meet and then like kind of wrestling with all of that and putting it in a really modern setting where we're doing comic book families and, and um, also really taking a look at what a relationship like that is, you know, if, it lasts more than a week or however long. Uh, I think the timeline in, in uh, Romeo and Juliet is very short from start to uh, the unpleasant end. Um, so I really wanted to kind of explore that and also um, do my version of kind of a Romeo and Juliet fix it. Like what if, what if Juliet had really involved parents and really great friends and and all of that. So that was something that I was really excited to explore. So one more question from the chat um, from Bill. He actually was just asking for you to repeat the names of the characters, their nicknames for each other. Um, and I'd love to add on to that a question about where their actual names came from. Yeah, so uh, their nicknames that they give each other. So well, first, their real names are Ridley and Jubilee. Um, and, uh, they both have kind of nerdy comic book names. Um, Ridley is, is sort of named after, uh, Ridley Scott, the filmmaker, and then Jubilee is actually, uh, an X-Men character. And this, her name came about because, kind of in honor of my same best friend, actually, who also got the, uh, the Robin shout out in my book. Uh, her husband uh, also does comics, and he had said if they ever had a daughter, they wanted he wanted to name it Jubilee, and uh, which again is an X Men character. And my friend was like, "That will never happen. Uh, I am not naming my child after a character in the X Men." Uh, so when it came time to name her, that story came up again. I was reminded of that, and I said, "You know." I will name her, like she can be the Jubilee that you never got. <laughs> so that's how she got it. And then their nicknames uh, for each other are Peak uh, because she is dressed as a peacock when they first meet. And his nickname is Bats and he is dressed as a very um, poorly done Batman. He basically just has a Batman mask on and her friend, Jubilee's best friend actually calls him Office Batman. Uh, because he just has on like a shirt, like he's going to work, and then a bat mask that his sister has forced him to wear. So anyone else with questions who wants to jump in and ask in the chat or raise your hand, you can feel free. We've been talking about Verona Comics, which is available to be ordered at northshire.com. Um, and David has shared the link in the chat a few times. Um, if there are not other questions, we can head towards wrapping up, but thank you all so much for, oh, actually, hold on. We do have one more question, which is if Jen, um, it would be great if you could share a little bit more about your comics. Oh, um, 
Yeah, so my, uh, I have an all ages comic called Circadia, um, which I put on uh, Kickstarter and it did very well. So each issue was uh, crowdfunded and it follows a ballerina and uh, kind of an assassin from the Queen's Guard as they try to um, untangle dreams from reality while battling a monster on both fronts. So it's very like timey, wimey, wibbly, wobbly, like which reality is real. Um, and then a really fun thing that I did was, um, even though it tells one cohesive story across all five issues, I did it anthology style. So I had a different um, team of queer artists working on every single uh, issue. So I got to really kind of showcase the work that was being done um, across the industry. And um, yeah, so it was pretty, it was pretty exciting and it was a great way to really get a lot of voices out there. Um, I used artists everywhere from like Jen Bartel, who is very huge comic name, does a lot of Marvel designs, all of the like Puma shoe tie-ins to all the Marvel movies. Um, so I worked with her and then I would also work with somebody who was like a senior at Rhode Island Institute of Design. Like, it was um, so. It was very a very cool experience. There's another question here that I think both of you could address, and it's from Mary Lindner. She's asked, "I think writing an authentic teen voice can be a challenge. Can y'all talk about that?" Yes, it's hard. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it definitely it definitely can. Uh, be a challenge. Um, I spend a lot of time around um, teens just from my work and also, um, you know, which I think definitely helps because there is like a disconnect. Sometimes you pick up a YA novel and all of the references are to like 90s music and 90s movies and all of that. And you know that the person is really possibly has not seen a teenager since they were a teenager. Um, so I think there's definitely, you, you definitely have to find a balance, and especially these days, kids are dealing with a lot more things than, than even I had to deal with. It's, it's a really different, um, it's a really different world, I think, with all of the different kinds of technology we have and, and all the different, you know, things, unfortunately, like school shootings and, and things like that. It just really, I think, has changed kind of the psyche of teens as a whole. And Isabel, you do a lot with your day job if you wanna talk about that. So that I would imagine would be a really good asset. Yeah, definitely. And even so right now I work, um, I am the program coordinator for an LGBTQ center. So I spend a lot of time with queer youth um, and that definitely influences kind of like how I kind of view teens and and I have a lot of respect for teenagers um, and they go through a lot. And I think with writing an authentic teen voice, it's important to remember and really kind of dig into who that one particular character is because all of my teens, you know, even within like our kind of small semi-rural community, you know, they each kind of have their own sort of like voice. So I don't think you can kind of have like one quote unquote teen voice because teens are so different based on, you know, just what else is going on in their life and whether they're from, you know, rural areas or urban areas, if they're, you know, white teens or teens of color, like they all just have a kind of different ways of speaking and life experiences and things. Um, but even before I worked where I do now, I worked in college student housing. So for, you know, six, seven years, I was working a lot with like 18, 19 year olds. And now I'm with a lot of like 14, 15 year olds. And even just that, there's a huge difference in kind of <laughs> how those two age groups view the world. Um, and I always, you know, I crack up when reviewers say that, you know, books or characters in YA books are, you know, make bad choices or they're really impulsive or they are overdramatic. And I'm always just like, have you talked to a teen lately? <laughs> they feel things very deeply and they, you know, to adults and they seem like they're overreacting, but that is like their real emotions and it's everything is, is so heightened for them. So I always crack up when I read those reviews um, about you know, any YA book and they're like, 
these people are so immature. I'm like, yes, they're 15. <laughs> they I are know. Immature. I love that. <laughs> Whenever I get a review that's like, they were so immature and they didn't make it. I'm like, excellent. Like, or this reads like a kid's book. I'm like, excellent. Like, that's, <laughs> like, that's my that? audience. <laughs> that's my goal. If they seem like they're acting like teenagers and I've done it, you know, well. And I think that's part of um, why I've had so many teens connect to it because I think that they can tell when a book is really written for them, mm -hmm. you know? And I think you do a really good job with that too, um, with your witches series. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think there's, you know, it's always, I mean, I appreciate all of my readers, but there is nothing like when I had one of my teens at the center where I work read my book and he came in and he was like, Oh my gosh, I loved your book. And I was like, to me that there's nothing better than that is when a teen right. like gives you the stamp of approval. It's like, you know, you did good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love, you know, I think why it gets a lot, you know, it has a lot of adult readers because of the way it handles things. I think because um, in terms of, like diversity, I think YA is doing a lot more heavy lifting. Um, the rest of the industry is, you know, I think trying to get there, um, but I think YA has been really on the forefront of that. So I think that pulls, it, you know, and we handle it often. I try to instill in my work anyway, a sense of hope throughout, even when it's kind of dark. Um, so I think that's why we get so many so many adult readers and I'm so grateful, like you said, I'm really grateful to anyone that, that reads the book and connects with it and, and shares with it. But there's nothing like hearing a, a kid say like, this is exactly what I needed in that moment. You know, that's really, um, that's why I do it. I'm so, sure that's why you do it too. Yeah, definitely. Like I said, like going to the school visits and seeing the teens and um, you know, and I work with teens who a lot of the kids that I work with um, are writing their own stories and wanting to write books. And so I'm always encouraging them to do that because, you know, they're going to be, you know, the 10 years from now or five years from now, they could be kind of the next, you know, people coming up behind us. So they're really creative, awesome kids. So I know. Like very impressive. When I go to school visits, I'm like intimidated. <laughs> I'm like, you guys are doing so much more than like when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. You know, I would like go to school and come home and then like write in my little journal. But they have their, you know, I mean, there's some real teens, and I do kind of tackle that um, in a future project I have with you know, there's a, a lot of teens and young adults out there that are really making an effort to change the world for the better and um it's just really awesome like it's awesome to see and it's awesome to be able to connect with them um through writing okay <laughs> so we are just we are just about out of time um so thank you so much everybody for being here this evening thank you so much to jen and isabel this has been absolutely fascinating and it's great <laughs> to see both of your faces again um i guess one year to the day after our event together at northshire to celebrate hot dog girl which is kind of amazing yeah um, thank you all of you for joining us um david has shared links to order hot dog girl and rona comics and both of Isabel's witches books in the chat. Um, you can find them all at northshire.com by searching either author's name. That also will work. Um, we are still shipping books out of our Vermont store and those web orders are keeping us alive um, and here and able to do programs like this. So thank you everybody for your ongoing support. Um, we've been incredibly grateful for the web orders that we've been getting. Um, and thank you again to both of our guest authors for being here and celebrating with us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, this was so much fun. Thank you so much. It's been a, it's a pleasure to kind of see some Saratoga sort of events when I'm normally in Manchester. <laughs> um, this has been great. Thank you all so much. And thanks to all of us, all of y'all for coming. See you yep, soon. We'll see you all next week on Tuesday and Thursday for more great events. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>